Welcome to the Mortal Realms and Age of Sigmar story phase. Grab your hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the Age of Sigmar. Your allies through the Realm Gate this episode are... I'm Davey, and as a wise man once said, the more Aether Gold we come across, the more problems we see. Uh, I'm a, I'm Olympic Aether Gold medalist, Aaron. My name is Paul, and some might call me a grown struck pun holder. And I'm Eric, no one. A land lover <laughs> from another mother. In this episode, we visit the Aether Streams and our first full story about Sky Dwarden in C.L. Werner's Overlords of the Iron Dragon. You can listen to this on your favorite podcast app. We're on Podbean. Give us a review, help us, uh, and share more stories with the AOS community. Uh, or come watch us on YouTube. Like and subscribe and comment down below. How are you tonight, gentlemen? Better now. Now that Good. we're doing this. <laughs> now that we got all that all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that I'll never hear another pun again, right? Never. Right. Oh, never, never. Yeah. Too late. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, <And> Elric. <laughs> um, what's What's new with you guys since we uh, last got a chance to uh, record together? Not a whole bunch. Just uh, watching very closely this Malign Portents uh, releases. Excited about that. That's pretty cool. Yep. Uh, I've been taking a dive in a shade spire. Went up to uh, Wapaka's uh, Grand Clash there. Uh, got my teeth kicked in, but did okay enough to get fourth and got some sweet loots. So that those, was pretty fun. Those two things yeah. don't go together: getting your teeth kicked Man, in and getting fourth place. Michael, if you played more shade uh, spire, I lost so bad to that. Like the only thing worse than getting wiped out is to get wiped out. And be like, well, at least that's over. And then he's like, and now I score annihilation for five more glory. And you're like, wow. <laughs> That is like salt in the wound, and then the wound gets stabbed again, and then more salt in it. So sure. stabbed with a salt knife. <laughs> I think I think I just got a killed so bad knife. that game that I felt it, it, uh, it tinted the rest of the. the uh, well, I think uh, we're all waiting for the hit rock body bottom, Davy, and ask for help. Uh, <laughs> ask for help for yeah, just for recovery um, from from who? From Shane's all fire. of us are TWX. You know, I mean, this is a this is a drug that's taking him over. Um, <laughs> But the, the lunch the lunch spire has been pretty good. I uh, haven't yep. done with that. Um, I did. Well, it was hear, going pretty good. <laughs> I did hear that somebody <laughs> won a game of Shade Spire forty one to like like somebody. <laughs> wow! I, uh, that's what I heard. I don't wait like that. You know, or I read, it, I read it on Twitter. Okay, yeah, it's possible. I guess if you had Garrick with. Uh, grizzly trophy fighting the skeletons, and somebody was just like a crazy person and kept bringing stuff back. I don't know. Was... No, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, but that's been fun. Been reading the Malign Portance stories, it's been cool too. And Jack. Uh, on the Shades Bar thing, been listening to the Shades Bar audio dramas, which thumbs up. Um, I think I've always said the uh. The fiction for this universe works best for me when it's in the, the short fiction, you know, a short story sort of thing. And so they're similar to that length and uh, they just have a different vibe to them. They're like, it's like, uh, like horror audio, maybe. I think like they, they <laughs> seem like a, instead of an action genre, they seem uh, horror in there. Like, I don't know. I thought they were, they're very well executed and were a good match for subject matter to, um, uh, to media that they were using. I thought they were, they were good for that audio. Did you listen to the uh, the Wanderer one, the, the Wood Elf one? Halfway through it, and then we cut a call, and uh, my phone is out of juice, but I'm excited <laughs> to get back to it. But Top I'm here nine. with you instead of listening to it. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> I, I was suspicious because I was like, ah, Aaron's just saying that because there's a Wanderer in there. But uh, you might be right. It might be the best one. Last it's, one, best one, as a wise yeah. man once said. That's one, best one. <laughs> Sounds wise. What about, what about you, Eric? What you been up to? I've been uh, working a little bit on uh, publishing a document based on our um, skirmish campaign. Oh, mm. sure, I've heard of that. Uh, kind of rude yeah. none of us, uh, the rest of us, to mention that so far, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so renown it, uh, renown or ruin is the name of the pack, and it's going to be it's a a role play um, campaign uh, supplement for skirmish. The way so um, you know. All of my friends, they each are running a war band with a hero and some followers, and they're kind of working together towards an overarching storyline, but in each of the battle plans, 
trying to tweak it so there's a little bit of competition and and uh, skullduggery uh, going on. Um, and uh, so far, I, I can't get you guys to play anything else. <laughs> Which is, a, a, I mean, a, a compliment. I think that's... Yeah, a, it's a compliment, right? Yep. So uh, that's going to be actually out uh, by the time this is up or, or a couple of days after this is up, uh, it'll be out. Um, and did you consult with the man himself, uh, originator of originator of the uh, the precursor to yeah. skirmish? I have Sam's blessing. Yeah, ooh, uh, that's, that's a nice. good blessing to have. It's yeah, Sam, uh, who wrote the hinterlands and gave us the spark for the realm master, um, became a, a rules writer at uh, Games Workshop. Yeah, kudos, buddy. Yeah, nice guy. Yeah, and he. Does the blessing give you plus one to hit or something like that? <laughs> I mean, I think I, it's plus one to wound. I, I actually, well, so literally, Realm Master does whatever the heck he wants. So I, I <laughs> yeah. give myself <laughs> three plus, plus five to do what I want. Um, but he had to take down Hinterlands, or just felt like it was necessary to take down Hinterlands. Everyone who who has it has it. It's not it's not going to grow or anything like that. So um, we're we're just creating something to to grow off of that and, and tread some ground that hasn't been tread. So, um, and then uh, if you're interested, shameless plug, if you're interested in some tokens or some dice to be picked up at Adepticon, uh, Acon. Check, sorry, not yeah, Acon, um, check uh, our Mortal Realms <laughs> my Twitter, uh, for, uh, for some pricing, $5 for a set of 20 tokens, $10 for a set of 10 dice, pre-order them on PayPal, um, yada, 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 that's up. All right, so talking about uh, stories about short things. I mean, whoa, oh, whoa. Well, whoa, seamless, whoa. seamless transition, professional segue. <laughs> Man, I wish I could do a segue tour. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it's getting, just in a segue somehow, it's, segue. somehow it's getting worse. Wow. Getting yeah. farther from the topic. <laughs> That's, but not very fast because segues are not good. <laughs> I, well, I got a segue story for you at some point, but we'll <laughs> oh, how, how relevant did my segue just become? I also have a segue story, more. but that's for another time. Um, all right, so let's let's jump in. Let's do it. All right, we got the story phase. In the story phase, we delve into the stories, characters, creatures, and environments of the nine realms. Far above the highest mountain peaks, a new power has arisen. The Dwarden have developed new technology and weapons of war, and now they sail the skies in their amazing airships, seeking wealth and plunder. Brockrin Ulison, captain of the Ang Drac, has a reputation for bad luck. Unless his fortune turns, and soon, he will lose his ship and his livelihood. When he and his crew discover the location of a source of ether gold of unparalleled quality, the temptation is too strong to resist. No matter what dangers present themselves, the Dwarden desire wealth beyond all. But when Brockrin release, realizes what the, the true cost of the Aether Gold will be, is it too late for him to save himself, his crew, and his ship? Did <laughs> the answer yes? Uh, yeah, it's actually, you find that out in like chapter It's too late. Two, like it's yeah. The end of it. Yeah. yeah. The rest of it's just like ages. 18 right. chapters of funerals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dwarf so, funerals. One chapter in, the book's over. Yep, it's a, it's a uh, bunch of like, Tolkien esque songs for the rest of the book. After that. <laughs> Descriptions I'm, of the landscape for about twenty seven pages. Better than a, a Martin description of a meal. Um, guys, can we <laughs> talk about Lords of the Iron Dragon? I want sure. I want to I want to talk about the facts. Spoiler okay. free. Let's get let's yep. get everybody introduced into what we're what we're talking about. Charles, the things that we will find within the pages. Family friendly. Oh yeah, very family friendly. I'm trying to think Spoiler free. <laughs> Spoiler free and family friendly. Those those go hand in hand. Um, the facts. Let's let's talk about when. When does the story take place? Um, yeah, in relation to other stories, are we pushing the narrative forward, forward? Forward. Yada yada yada. So, as far as I understand it, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, this this is this is a story that takes place after the Realm Gate Wars. Um, maybe even after the fact uh, when when Sigmar is finding his cities. Um, yeah. I'm basing that off the fact that I think we know at this point, for reasons that will be clear later, that uh, the Celestin Prime has already touched down. He's already uh, he's already showed his face. He's waging war against the agents of chaos. Do so we know yeah, that happened? You're yeah. correct. 
uh, in, in the Realm Gate Wars. And I think uh, the, the sheer fact that the KO or, or the, the Overlords are even being seen in the realms right now is sort of a signifier that it's after the Realm Gate Wars because yep. they, they waited until after before they showed their face. Sort of. Yeah, there were just tens of them throughout the Realm Gate Wars, but they didn't they didn't uh, make a move until those had resolved. Yeah, exactly. I, heard, I heard because of his showiness, everyone calls him Celestin Prime Time. Now. Okay, is that what you <laughs> uh, I'm As long as you continue to... As long as you continue to call him that, I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, <laughs> don't deviate from that. Uh, so yeah, uh, now that we know that the overlords are basically down from the clouds, uh, bartering and trading with the terrestrial denizens, um, I think that's a, a signifier that we're, we're past the Realm Gate Wars. We're, we're in the sort of more civilized part of uh, the Age of Sigma. Um, all right, we got the win. Let's talk about the where. Uh, in in the, the Realm of Chaman. When we're... Uh, <laughs> Exactly. That's all I hear when I say it. Uh, if, if it now, be, they, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah, they could. I I believe that the KO, you know, have the ability to to have uh, uh, traversed other realms. However, I think all six of the major sky ports are currently located in Shaman, um, and it is uh, the greatest source of either gold. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, exactly. Where they'd be at, so. So I was reading in the Battle Tome, um, it, in Chaman is, is where the Ether Stream is, yeah. um, Ether Gold Stream, and so that's kind of why the, the different ports are sort of congregated yeah. there. Um, yeah. So Chaman's the place to be when you're a, a Karadran Overlord. Um, yeah. So you're going you're gonna to see a lot of Overlords there, but also when we're, we're, we're in Chaman, uh, you're probably going to see a lot of followers of Zinch as well. Um, we see a lot of that in the Realm Gate Wars, but... Uh, I feel like different realms sort of have different influences by the different chaos powers, and uh, Zinch, for the most part, is the is the the face you're going to come across um, when you're in the realm of metal as well, yep. which yeah. informs the story a little bit. Anything else about anything else about the where before we carry on? Uh, only that it doesn't seem to uh, lean on any. As far as I was able to pick up, it didn't seem to lean on any places that we're already familiar with, right? Like. I wasn't yeah, like, no. oh, like I know that place from so and so, or yeah, I remember when, um, when the Hammers of Sigmar, you know, made their move in the campaign, went up the, the Silver Falls, Argent Falls, and all that sort of thing. So th there wasn't any uh, familiar touchstones there, which is fine. Uh, they're just kind of establishing some new area. Um, mm -hmm. So, yep. I think point. one of the, one of the points I would make is that this is not an urban book whatsoever. There's no like actual cities or civilizations that we encounter. Mm. That's um, fair. That's right. Fair Yep. Yep. No skyports, nothing like that. So, is, are the ether wind, the ether gold streams, are they really just stuck in Shimon, or do they trail into the other? That's a good question. I, I can't. Uh, so they, I don't know for certain. I um, without checking the book, I think that they are predominantly in Shimon, but I think they uh, they can pop up in other realms um, mm -hmm. if for no other reason they give the, the overlords reasons to be in other realms. Yeah, well. that's the impression that I got. I, I did a search earlier today to try and find the answer to that question, and I got no reason to believe that they're, that they're only in uh, Shimon. Um, but mm -hmm. again, it doesn't explicitly say one way or the other. Yeah. I, that's cool I got the feeling... uh, it's a com Go ahead. I got the feeling it was a little bit like a jet stream almost, like in an ocean. Mm -hmm where it's yeah. kind of this current that pulls things into it. But as the jet stream can get messed up and we have La Nina and El Nino, right? Same thing happens with this jet stream and it goes into other realms. Yeah. I think of it as a combination jet stream and like a, a mining vein, like finding a vein of ore. So it's the two things where they kind of search for it, prospect for it, because they can apparently they can you know, pop up where you're, you're not expecting them. <clears throat> they can develop and... and uh, get harvested and such uh, but it also just kind of you can have like predominant ones you know so yeah, um, sure. yeah. all right so we've, we've talked about the ko and we sort of talked about the zinc let's 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 talk about the who who are the who are the players in this story so uh for the most part we're, we're following the perspective of a, of a one mr oh you said it before is it, is it brockren ulison um who's the, the captain of the titular Iron Dragon, and I just wanted yeah. to use the word titular. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's a new character. I mean, at least I haven't seen him in any of the stuff we've read so far. Right. Um, but knowing that he's a, a captain of a, a, of a KO uh, ship, um, you, you can assume that he's a, he's a hardy stock. He's going to be brave. And uh, yeah. like most of the KO, I, I reckon he has at least a, a passing interest in collecting that sweet, sweet loot. Yeah. 
So he's a captain. I think he's a captain of an ironclad specifically. Um, yep. And uh, which is, uh, you know, you pick whatever character you want. It's not something you can play it like you would have a miniature on your ironclad that is the captain, you know, manning the manning the wheel. But it's not somebody that like dismounts and, and walks around, which is interesting. So you have the chance to explore that a little bit of like, what does it mean to have the captain of the ironclad? And, you know, mm-hmm. does he have a role outside of like steering the steering wheel or whatever? Um, so he's not an admiral. Um, which, you know, might've been your, your default assumption for what the lead character in something like this would be. And he's, he's not an Arcanaut captain, but, uh, Ironclad captain of the Iron Dragon, yeah. which is an important thing, right? So, sure, sure. um, and I think yeah. and we can get well, into it later, but, um, it, it's interesting because a lot of the other characters that we see that are on our ship, on his ship are represented by, by models. Like you can right. check off all the boxes of all the different hero characters. We, we've got them in this story. Um, but yeah, yeah. not so much. And the captain is sort of a. A deal unto itself. Yeah. Um, I would point out uh, he is leading a fleet, so it's not just the ironclad, right? He's got ironclad, I think he has yeah, a couple two frigates. frigates a couple. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not just so one ship. Yeah. He may be, he may be an admiral by, by another name, not as, not mm-hmm. as equipped, but yeah. But again, like it's, it's one thing that's nice about the books is they don't, you know, they're, they can be inspired by the game, but they don't have to hew specifically to, like, this guy must have this equipment because that's what that model has in the game yeah. or whatever. So um, it's a way, certainly, you wouldn't want the authors to be totally bound up by, um, you know, what the rules are and all that sort of thing. So. Yeah, hands, hands aren't bound in that regard. Um, so that's, that's, on the, that's on the good guy's side. That's for the, I mean, we get a few other point of views, but, like, that's generally the character we're following. Um, mm-hmm. But... On the uh, on the less than honorable side, we're, we're following an individual named Coram, mm-hmm. uh, who is a Zinchian Cursling, as far as I understand it. He's called Cursling a whole bunch of times in the book, but yep. not so much like a Cursling that I think we are used to seeing or that we or well, see in the model. Yes, or am I, yeah. or am I wrong? Uh, I think yes and no. Like, so he's he's not not like the model where he's got the big dude like out. He's got like a small little mouthpiece on his shoulder. Uh, so again, I thought it was a cool uh, take on instead of you know like a- anything from Zinch is gonna be as variable as your imagination can be. So um, I enjoyed that he was a cursling and looked different. Sometimes I guess some curslings can be totally controlled by their homunculus, like that takes over, and then the, the human itself is like a total automaton, can't do anything. And this was this was not that. There was more of a uh, symbiotic relationship. Um, instead of uh you know purely parasitic or something like that so sure. mm-hmm. um, are, are Christians I, more typically like martial in in like their skill set or do we see them as or sorcerers i think they're they're hybrid right well, like mm-hmm. uh, they have they have the you know um combat power and also some amount of magical power um, exactly. Certainly in Hammer Hall, right? It was a it was a more combat oriented person. Correct. Yeah, and I guess that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah. Well, and in Eighth Edition, the figure was called Village the Cursling, so it was a specific character, and that had yeah. a different set of rules as well. Um, so this one feels feels a little bit more in the vein of that character than necessarily what the model is called now to me. Uh, sure. It feels more like an, an individual who evolved instead of almost an archetype that we have many of in the world. So, well, and but, yeah. I think David sort of alluded to it, but I like the idea that we can have this long enough of, of a conversation talking about him. The fact that like a cursling isn't just pigeonholed in a particular, you know, mm-hmm. type or structure, and, and even within one unit type, there can be all sorts of different interpretations on yeah. what they do and how they do it. Um, mobility, if they want. There's, no glass, there's no glass ceiling for this. Oh no, they can oh, upward mobility. Kind of Actually, mobility. Down, downward mobility too, left yeah. and right. But is there an ether gold ceiling? That's the real question. Oh, geez. How would anybody break that? Um, so he's, he's, he's a follower of Zinch. Guys, what, what does that mean? It means he's got plans and plots and uh, yeah. secrets and mysteries. And uh, he's going to bring them to bear on our, let's say, heroes in this story. Mm-hmm. He's also got a couple cool magic items. True, true. All kinds of plots. All kinds yeah. of tricks. Yeah, he's cool. You guys, out, you guys out of control. All right, so uh, let's 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 talk about the what. What are, what are we dealing with? What are we facing? So, Paul, you kind of alluded to it earlier when you read our little our little blurb. But uh, Brockren and his crew are out find their fortune, sort of <coughs> under the the umbrella of the this notion that they're having a string of bad luck 
or maybe even a curse. Who's, who's to say? Um, but they're doing what they can to sort of, you know, break it, whatever it is. Um, and uh, they're starting off uh, looking to wet their beaks a little bit, uh, trading with a set of tribal humans uh, when, surprise, surprise, they, they find more than what they, what they bargained for. Um, so, I mean, we know about the K.O. and how they're always out to make a buck. Uh, Broken yeah. and his school are, are, are no different. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're having a hard time of it. And so that's, that's where yeah. we catch up with them. Basically. And it's a good, it's a good uh, core premise because it draws on, you know, some of these things of what we know about the uh, overlords so far, but also like, you know, uh, historical naval traditions of this idea of like, luck it like has always been a big thing for uh you know seagoing vessels like there's there's bad omens and uh all this sort of thing even even in you know modern navies there's there's things that you know even if they don't believe in them it's considered bad luck to do you know particular things on a ship or something like that so i thought that was a, a nice place to ground it is a, a ship that feels like it's got to run a bad luck and you know that's got some correlations that you can see in uh, today's world sort of thing yeah better to be lucky than good I've always said. Yep. Why not be both? <laughs> Why not be both? If only it were that easy. All right. Yeah. And from uh, Corum's perspective, uh, like I said before, it, he's up to something. And uh, for whatever reason, he's got his sight uh, set on the, the, the overlords. Um, mm -hmm. And just from his perspective, his plans would go so much smoother uh, if he could just get his uh, battle-hungry fate master that he's uh, sort of pledged his loyalty to yep. to uh, get him to fall in line. Um, so there's I mean, he's, he's got a whole army on, on his side or a war band or whatever you want to call it, but there's sort of internal struggle there too that um, is going to drive some of the plot as well. Sure. And I think that fate master is worth saying a couple lines about. I don't know if that's better for later or, or uh, anyway right now. Hit me. I, Bring it on. So, I, you know, uh, it's we've seen a whole lot of uh, spell casting Zinch bad guys, right? Like, uh, that's, that's a archetype we're pretty familiar with. Um, sorcerers, they can summon demons, do all these rituals, but this was this is a guy who is devoted to the chaos god, you know, of sorcery and trickery, but he has no magical powers of his own as Fate Master. Um, and he's it's nope. it's more going on the uh, the destiny um, side of things. Like he's he's destined for this great fate. Uh, and, you know, it, it can't be he as so long as he's, you know, uh, working towards that he has Zinch's protection. So he's immune to sorceries and that sort of thing. So it sets up a cool dynamic between the, between the two of these, uh, these people. And I, I was interested to read about a Zinchian uh, follower who is not, you know, uh, not soaked in the ability to cast magic and, and all that sort of thing. That is cool. Well, That's and, and further, uh, and I think this, this doesn't spoil anything to say, but furthermore, it's interesting to follow a Zinchian character that for the most part doesn't necessarily have any interest in plots within plots within plots within plans. Um, right. He's a sure. fairly st mm -hmm. straightforward guy uh, as, we, yep. as, we, as we find out more about him, um, which is not the, the MO that we're, that we're used to. Yeah, it's like count on, count on destiny to uh, carry you through, like, you know, instead of, instead of, like, making your own destiny, like, it's already written for you, so, like, just do your thing and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall into place, right? So. Sure. And you can well, see how I, that would butt, butt heads with a, a more traditional sorcerer type sure. yeah. character. I, I, I kind of get the feeling that he was the character embodiment of like fate dice, right? <laughs> what? Oh, I want this to happen. It's going to happen. I want this to happen. It's going to happen, right? Like, Fair enough. kind of felt yeah. a little bit like that to me. Yeah. You know, fate master, fate lot, dice. He, exactly. He was very much basically in control itself. of his own destiny. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so that's the uh, that's the who. Anybody else you want to bring up? Before? Spoiler free. I think we got we're setting the table well there. All right, cool. Yep. Well, in that case, before we get into spoilers, which will be coming up soon, do we real quick want to have a little little powwow on, on generally what we thought about the book for those who are interested in reading reading it? What I like to ask is, hey, do you recommend this book? And if you do, who do you recommend it to? I want to ask uh, Paul first because he said a word. <laughs> I'm going to say no. I don't recommend this book, to be fair. Okay. Uh, I, I did not enjoy it as much as I hoped to. So, um, Do you think there's anyone out there that could would get something out of this book? Is there anybody that is... Uh, if you were a Zinch player, I could see a lot of fun. Um, and if you were an old school dwarf player, 
like Dwarven player, I think you probably enjoy this book more. Um, but if you are looking for more carriage on overlords, to me, this did not hit the mark. So. Fair, fair, fair. David, follow it up. What do you think? Um, I not as strongly as Paul. Uh, it was not my favorite of the entries in the Age of Sigmar um, fiction uh, thus far. I think the person that would enjoy reading is someone who hasn't like hasn't read the background on the overlords. It's kind of interested. Like it gives it gives kind of a baseline idea. Like if you didn't already know, if you already read through the whole battle tome and you're like, man, I really want that deep dive in there, then it's not gonna it's not gonna scratch that itch for you. Like you you kind of there's not a lot of revelatory things uh, about how the overlords operate that you wouldn't already know if you're very familiar with the battle tome. Um, so I think I think in that sense as someone who plays the army and was hoping for like oh man you know like let's really dig and let's learn some new things it was disappointing from that thing and so i think that uh affected my overall view of it um i did i did enjoy some of the the zinchin side of things um as much or more than some of the overlord side of things well right um how about you but to build off your point i i agree with what you're saying actually um i i would recommend the book to maybe those folks who want to read something about the, the, the overlords, but aren't in the mood, I guess, to read about it in a battle tome, battle tome format. Like maybe yeah, sure, sure. Totally. Precursor to the, to the battle tome. Um, yeah. If you just want to get a sense of uh, the army that way. I mean, yeah. realistically, as you sort of maybe alluded to, the, the battle tome maybe does as good, if not a better job uh, of it, but you know, say you're not into it. You want to read it in more of a no- novel format, this might be the way to start. Um, right. I think I liked a lot of some of the ideas presented uh, in the book. Um, so folks, if you, you, you hang on and uh, you want to find more about it when we get into spoilers, we can talk about some of the, the fun things that occur, but um, from a pop perspective, it, it doesn't necessarily rank as highly as, as some of the others. Um, but, but we'll get into that um, as time goes on. You'll notice I didn't ask Eric what he thought about the book. Oh, now he's muted, so he has, can't defend himself. Um, I, I thought the cover looked really nice. Good cover art. <laughs> it was good cover art. Eric's been cranking real hard. He's got uh, he's got a bunch of projects he's working for on our behalf, and don't just say that. But you can just say yourself. All right, <laughs> defend yourself. Have I, been, Dave. I mean, yeah. I mean, between uh, so yeah, just working on some other things uh, this go around, and then uh, I think the the tone I got. I mean, certainly, um, you know, Paul, your your critique kind of being not in favor of it or not getting what you wanted out of it made it a little bit harder to to want to you know, take the time away from other things like the renowned packet and work and all that kind of stuff so i just did not i did not and just it. straight up painting right now <laughs> yeah. i'll tell you what i didn't okay. know that was allowed uh, if that's allowed then i'm gonna start double double dipping. get on it get on it uh, no harm no foul just don't read the book and you'll have all kinds of free time right <laughs> That's all right, Eric. Tell you what, let's get into spoilers, and then we can tell you all about it, as yeah, if you had read the book. I'm excited to hear about it. Excellent. All right, so if anybody wants to read it and doesn't want to be spoiled, uh, t- t- turn it off now. Click, click that stop spoilers! button. Spoilers! And come back once you read it. Yeah, come back yeah. once you read it. And see if your opinions match up with the likes of ours. All right, starting now. All right, so let's, let's get into got, what happens. I got no clue. Tell me what happened. You want, to, you want to know? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and spill the beans. You guys, let me know if I forget anything. All right, so what do uh, the beans book, say? Uh, the beans or lentils, I guess, in this situation. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. funny because it's in the book. Yeah. All right, uh, so the, the book opens <laughs> up actually with a uh, with Coram, the, the Zinchian uh, Cursling, and he and his his crew are are laying into a a fleet of Karajan yeah. overlords. I don't know, a bunch of ships, anyways. Yeah. Um, He's sick in mm. sky fires and, and burning chariots and all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and all kinds taking, of flying things. Yeah, all sorts of burning, flying things, taking the fight to these ships who are trying, you know, desperately trying to defend themselves. Um, he's uh, um, amongst the fray is that uh, is that fate master that we were talking about. I, what's his name? To 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 something. Got a T name. That's you guys' homework to figure out what his name is. And so they're, they're, they, they've got the upper hand. Um, for reasons unbeknownst to us, uh, Coram decides to let up. He, he pulls up off the gas and, uh, and sort of gives them 
gives the dwarves a dwarven uh, some some respite. But oh no, I'm blanking. Eventually, uh, they they sort of trail them because they have bigger plans for them, and, and yeah. eventually they sick a they sick a, a giant unknown terror on them, which eventually brings the, the fleet down. Right? And that's that's basically mm-hmm. how the first fight goes. Yep. Um, what do we learn there? We we see these these dwarven fight on fighting on their uh, the deck. We with the point of view sort of from their aether chemist who's you know defending himself. We get the point of view of the admiral who's going toe to toe with the uh, the fate master. Um, there's all sorts of what are the guys with the bubbles flying around and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a pretty Riggers, yeah. yeah exactly. So it's a, it's a pretty active, fast paced battle going on um, yeah. on, on the decks of the ship. Kind of what what you, what you want to read when you see a fight in the air like that. Yeah. Um, totally. But then, lo and behold, the the KO don't don't make it out alive. Um, These guys are from Barak Urbaz, for what it's worth. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I do believe. Cool. Uh, and so that's that's the end of that fight. Uh, fast forward a few days, probably not weeks. So it must be days later. Uh, we we finally join up with um, Brockrin on on his Iron Dragon ship. So, like we said before, they're they're trying to find their fortune. They're trying to. Um, sort of scratch back any sort of money that they can make and to do so they're going to start trading with these uh, nomadic tribes of humans in the, the hills or mountains of um, Shaman. Um, so they make their way there. Uh, they sit down um, hoping that they can get there first because it's the proper season to be trading with these folks. And hopefully they, they got there before any other um, KO uh, ships uh, were able to trade with these humans. And they find out, oh no, we're sort of on the tail end and we're not necessarily getting the, the best stuff. However, uh, they find that the humans have something a little bit, a little special, uh, <coughs> unexpected. They have a bunch of uh, Karajan Overlord, I don't know, equipment, uh, wreckage, salvage. It's immediately identifiable by our by our heroes, which leads to some, you know, raised eyebrows, some suspicion, some um, concern by uh, the the overlords. So, uh, as you might expect, they have have questions about how these humans got uh, this this loot and the humans are trying to defend themselves saying no 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 we found it we found it it was off in the hills like we had nothing to do with you know uh, destroying this this ship in fact we'll show you and so the humans send their chief son along with the ko to let them know uh, show, to show them where this record wreckage was to show them where they where they found uh all this overlord stuff um so there's a hot second where the overlords are real suspicious and they think that the humans are up to no good and so they're on edge but eventually they they roll up to the wreckage of that first ship that we were talking about, um, and they find that, oh yeah, this is a, a wreckage that these humans couldn't have caused. It's a suspicious sort of uh, destructive uh, scene. Yeah, and they, they, they do a little bit, of, little bit of uh, forensics on it, you know, like they're putting together like, yeah, the, the force that wrecked this thing, it's it's not something these humans, these human tribesmen have the ability to bring to bear, so this must be something else going on. Sure, and we were we were on edge for a while. Like em- yeah. Emotions were running high before they, they were able to come to that conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as you might expect, they got to find out more. So they they set down and, and drop off, um, you know, for the most part, all the characters that we're following on the, the Overlord ship. We've got Brockren, uh, the captain. We've got uh, his his leader of his Thunderers, uh, Dern something something. Oh my God, I have my list right here. Oh, I'm going to look it up. <laughs> it's the slowest list in the world. Drewmark, uh, his Thunderer. What's, what's the Thunderer champion called, Davy? Uh, Gunmaster? I'm not Gun, sure. Gunnery Sergeant, maybe? Gunnery Sergeant. Gunnery Sergeant is what right it's yeah, I did. I wrote that down, actually. Uh, we've got uh, Gotram, his Arcanite champion. I didn't write that one down. I don't know what that's called. but um, He's got his Etheric Navigator, uh, Mortrim, his Engine Master, Forgar. These are, these are awesome, fun names. Uh, and... Uh, and then his Skaggy, his Logisticator, which isn't a model as far as I understand. It's a, no, a new thing. No, but it's thing. an important role. Apparently. Are they talked about yep. in the yep. battle films? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember if those specifically, but they it's they mentioned other uh, other existing roles and guilds and that sort of thing. So that not the, not the primary guilds, but they're, they, you know, touches on them. So again, like... Having, having said, <clears throat> you know, you don't learn a whole bunch of other stuff. This is this is at least something, you know. Sure. Which you, you pick up on. So, so uh, this, this whole the whole lot of them end up and sit for the most part end up sitting down on this this wreckage ship and they're investigating and just sort of find out what happened. So as far as I can tell, they they can find no survivors, heck, no remnants of any you know deceased dwarfs or dwarden right off the bat. 
Um, it seems pretty, uh, pretty pick clean. Um, and I think before they investigate too, too much farther, they start hearing uh, animalistic savage noises sort of building up in the ship, around the ship, what have you. And they are fairly quickly beset uh, by a uh, flesh eater court. Court, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Um, uh, a whole bunch of ghouls, um, the the bigger ghouls, the crypt, whatever, whatever's, um, and especially a, a var gulf uh, who sort of lead in the, leading the charge. And so this is, I think, the first battle that we see with our our, our second group of KO as they're sort of defending themselves and, and, and fighting amongst the wreckage of the ship with the, the flesh of your courts. Um, a lot of shooting of ghouls, a lot of people getting gnawed on, et cetera, et cetera, much as you'd expect. Um, the, the captain broker and ends up one on one uh the, the Vargol, uh, knocks mm-hmm. him down into a hole, um, and, and eventually is victorious, or so we think. Um, and they have, they have some respite to sort of investigate the ship more more fully. Um, yeah. While Brockman's down in the hole, what does he find? But another uh, another Dwarden, another overlord who has yeah. sort of been hidden um, amongst the, the crates and the, the barrels and what have you of the hold of the ship. Um, what do you know? It's one of the characters that we had sort of met in that first chapter. Um, yeah. The, the Aether chemist uh, Grot something, something. Gro- Grokmund. Yeah. The names all start to sound the same. Um, Gro- Grokmund. Um, and so he's, he's on death's door. Uh, he's, he's, he's barely held on this, this whole time, um, but they're able to, to find him and rescue him and sort of bring him on the hold, out of the holes. As he's being lifted up um, into the, to the top of the, the wreckage ship so they can be loaded up on their, their mobile ship, he, he cries out and he says, no, no, you gotta get, you gotta get, um, you gotta get something I left down on the hold. You gotta, you gotta find my, uh, my box. My box, basically. Apparently, this box is real important. Um, uh, Gotram, the Arcanaut captain, jumps down and tries to find what he's looking for. He feels like responsibility for this guy. And before he can find anything, he has to then fight that same Vargle f- from before. Um, yeah. Beat him up. Uh, he's, he's pretty weakened, so I think that's how I can justify how just like a, a run of the mill, you know, champion can, can take on this, this Vargle. Um, sure. But eventually, he prevails. Um, and in doing so, he's able to additionally find this this box that the Aether Chemist left down there. We don't know what it is. It seems pretty important, though. Uh, so uh, he makes his way out, not before burning the whole the whole ship down, sort of accidentally. He lights a lights a fire, which sort of contributes to him beating the Vargulf, and away away they go. Um, as you might expect, every 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 book that has this sort of setting uh, needs to finish up with them being chased by the, their skin or their teeth as, as more and more uh, flesh eater courts sort of pop up out of nowhere and start uh, attacking them. So they're able to quick hop on their ships, go, 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 find the ladders, so on and so forth, and they're get, able to get out of there just in the nick of time. That's the bullet there. <laughs> uh, guys, did you like, did anything stand out in those, in those couple of scenes that we've covered? Anything you like about it? Any redeeming qualities, Paul? Uh, I liked the barbarian tribe yeah. that they were trading with. I thought that was a cool idea. Um, I liked the fact that he showed that a a fleet could dock on something that was not an ether dock, right? Because yeah. they they did, basically there was a spire of rock, and they kind of anchored themselves to the spire of rock. So that was kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. That was what, what I enjoyed. Out of it. Uh, David, anything stand out? Anything stand yeah. out for you? So I'll second that because I, I think this is uh, part of when the book was at its strongest because um, for me it was hitting some of those things where I was interested in like how do overlords interact with the greater Age of Sigmar world um, as it comes. And so like, you know, the barbarians are lighting a beacon to call down the, you know, the skyfarers um, and, uh, you know, that interaction where their language isn't great and they're trying to, you know, get these pelts and just some of the ways that they might earn money that isn't just, you know, searching for Aether gold. Um, so that was, that was some where it's at its uh, most intriguing of figuring out how they, how they interact in, in that kind of environment. Um, so I thought that was pretty strong. Right on. Yeah. No, I, I like this one. I like um, the idea of the, I mean, yeah, the, the tribal humans, the free people. Uh, and it came up in War Beast. It came up in, um, uh, a few others, but my goodness, we just, we just need barbaric people. 
as mm-hmm. like a model range. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will, I guess, just go ahead and say this was one of my big problems uh, that I started with was this is the first KO battle that was on land, and I was kind of hoping for some kind of a unique battle style from the Caradron Overlords. Um, and what I really thought was being set up here uh, was they talked about the tribal chief's son and how he was running across the deck, even though it was slanted because it was crashed. But then the Caradron Overlords had these magnetic boots that they were walking around on. And what I thought he was going to set up is that obviously the Caradron aren't really good in close combat. So I thought he was going to set up that they were going to walk on the underside well, of the deck. He did one on one of our goals, so. Well, but that's what I'm saying, because I thought he was going to stand on the ceiling, right, with his magnetic boots, and then just keep shooting away at the Vargulf. No, and I was it. like, okay, I could totally see how that would work. And then it just ended up being an, a hand-to-hand battle, and he won, and I was like, oh, that, that's just kind of what a dwarf would do. That doesn't seem like something that a carriage on Overlord would do, so. This is basically uh, a space dwarf. Yeah. Exactly. So there was some fun with a little bit of fish out of water with the the cheap sun riding on board. You know, getting mm-hmm. getting a little seasick or like looking over the edge without any. You know, like he's not wearing the boot. You know, like yeah, they're like yeah. this damn this this damn fool is gonna fall to his death here. If he's not careful, <laughs> We're gonna so. be blamed for it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, yeah, ironic you bring that up because. Doesn't he die? Doesn't the Vargolf get him? Like yeah, in in yeah, the fight, yeah. he, no. up, he he valiantly saves somebody. Like he he quits himself well, but he does die in this fight. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. I was just getting attached to him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for the five and minutes. Now, and now you're telling me, he's, oh, man. like like he was attached yeah. to the ship with his man and his boots. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's move right along. So. uh where do we find our, our dwarves? They're up. They're up on their ship now, narrowly having escaped the uh, the flesh eater courts. Um, so now they're trying to figure out, oh, oh, oh crap, what do we do? Um, we've got we've got this ether chemist. Um, let's 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 wake him up and try and figure out like what his story is. Like let's get let's get um, get it from the horse's mouth. Furthermore, and this is I think when you want to talk about what differentiates these dwarven from other dwarven, uh, they have a brief bit where they're trying to think how they can. I don't want to say not blackmail, but extort him for for money or reward for saving his life um, right mm-hmm. that, that kind of took a turn that i wasn't expecting um but uh they, they want to get his find out what happened to him and then more importantly find out what, what's in his box because i because they want it um like yeah. i said they're poor and they're sort of scrambling to get any sort of loot that they can and it was a little bit where you know the code is so important to the warden and but it's, it can be interpreted in many ways right to for the overlords so what does the code say about salvage and what does it say about who's got rights to what and how can they interpret it in a way that maximizes it? And there's some conflict here where Skaggy, the logisticator is trying to interpret it in the way that gives them the maximum profit. And some of the others are still struggling with the more traditional Dwarden ideas of, you know, what's honorable and what's, you know, uh, what's fair. So there's some yeah. conflict uh, cooking off on the crew right away there. Yeah. Well, and Skaggy's not, and at least at this point, not completely in the wrong as far as I'm concerned, because they, they have yeah. a debt to this, this human's family that they got to pay back because they let him die. Plus, they were already in sort of dire straits to begin with. So you yeah. can't really blame the guy for trying to find an angle, find a, yeah. a way to, to get his. Yeah. Um, so they eventually, they bring the chemist to, they ask him what happened. He said, hey, I got, I got beat up by some Zinch dudes. Uh, but you guys saved my box, right? No, yeah. Tell us all about it. We want what's in it. And I think at first he objects, or he's not he's not willing to get into it with them. Um, but eventually he has to acquiesce because they, they put they put the pressure to him. And uh, he cracks it open and he shows them some ether gold, ether gold, the likes of which these, these folks have never seen. So apparently it's a, a sample of a super rich vein that he and his group had discovered. Um, that uh, you know is infinitely more valuable than than the gold that. Uh, you would no- you normally find out there. Um, the uh, Iron Dragon was it the Endron Master? I think it was it was he um, who who went, goes and tries to smelt some of it, and he brings it back and sort of vouches for uh, Crockman's story, telling everybody, "Yeah, no, this is this is the real deal. This is hot stuff." Um, and so did, this is did he deal it after that. I'm sorry, say again. Did he did he deal it after that? Oh sure. I mean, if he smelt it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I can't. Uh, uh, wow. Eric, what are you painting over there? Like, you, I like that you... Can you, you, uh, you mute yourself like, and go back to yeah. painting? Like, I, I like that, that you was much better. Yourself. Guys, 
I don't have any of these questions, <laughs> these barriers, <laughs> this instruction in my head, worrying about the story. The only thing he has to think about right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I when it's better, I think it's better. <laughs> it's much better. And you're the you're the spice that's sprinkled yeah, please, on top of it. Please our... comment below with your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is, let's, we'll get through this dry stuff uh, real quick. So, um, so f when faced with this new discovery, uh, the, the 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 lieutenants uh, on on this ship immediately want to help uh, Grockman uh, retrace the steps and get himself back to this this rich vein because uh, they they see they see dollar signs in their eyes. They see the potential for profit. Um, so Grockman's all about getting back there because it's what. Uh, basically brought his ship down or you know he, he has an unfinished mission and everybody else wants to get that money money um however uh we find that this this really fancy aether gold is actually real not potent uh volatile volatile yeah 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 uh, it's 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 not just a simple task of running up and going to collect it especially because they're not in the right ship for it and so on and so forth so there's a lot of back and forth um uh, internal struggle strife between uh, the captain and his crew as to whether or not they should they should go after this this vein. Because it's not just him; like they've all they've all assumed some of the risk and debt just by going on this voyage. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Their their individual reputations are at stake, and not just his. That definitely absolutely. harkens back to like privateering and um, you know, being a pir you know, like the idea that being the captain of a ship and and it talks about it in the Kale lore, but like captain of the captain is is only captain as long as he's making leading the truth the, the crew in the right way and and to glory or to, to profit um, true. so that's, that's cool with that moment. and so i think it's around this time but who should show up but uh, our friend quorum and his, and his zine sheen crew that's the that's the first adversary right i think that's what's next. so and basically in this book oh. there about uh we can start the meeting now because we've reached quorum. Uh, it's with a K. It's cool. I'm, uh, not gonna, I'm not gonna allow that one. You take that back. Ignore it if you can. Yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. All right. Uh, so it's it's this, the same MO as, as before. Uh, uh, Grockman is. I've already I've already I've already done this, guys, because they come zooming in. Our, our, our the Zinchian followers on their discs. We got our burning chariots. We got. We got the Fate Master, Warlon is Glaive, we got Flamers, everybody's, everybody's rolling up, and so they're under attack yet again. Um, and I think in the, sa in the same vein as we saw before, uh, it seems like the, the Overlords are sort of getting overrun um, by the Zinchian, the Zinchian crew. Uh, but unbeknownst to them, Quorum and his, his Fate Master buddy are sort of having an internal power struggle as to whether or not they should really put the boots down on the, the Overlords' throats, if they should really, you know, go whole hog. Um, I'm taking him out uh, because Corum doesn't want to. He's got a plot. He's got a plan. He's got he's got things in motion for these KO. And he just wants to harry them. He just wants to drive them in a certain direction. Again, un unknown to us what his purposes are. And so when it seems like the ancient group is going to win, Corum um, uh, uh, pulls back and 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 convinces his followers to, to back off. Um, and to do so, he ends up yanking out their discs out from under them and uh, having yep. them plummet to their, their death. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, pretty hardcore, man. That's messed up. Basically, it's up downwards, not, not upwards. Um, yeah, and so that really, <laughs> really, drives his, uh, really drives the Fate Master wild. Um, but because his, his army is sort of dropping around him, literally, uh, he, has to, he has to pull back. Um, and let the overlords uh, live to fight another day. Um, overlords don't know what's going on. They don't understand why this is happening, but they'll take a victory where they can. And so a big cry rises up, and they're super stoked that they drove them off. Yeah, good job, us. We win. Um, <laughs> but we know the audience knows that it was a it was a close call. Uh, and again, after this, after this fight, we go back to that that old conversation that we were having before on on the on the deck on the ship. Um, Hey guys, we should go check out this this ether vein. Um, Skaggy is really pushing hard to uh, go help Grockman uh, reach the vein. Um, he, he's unconcerned or not and concerned enough, anyways, about the uh, the difficulties and the danger of mining this vein. Um, unlike the captain Brock Brockman, who, who is. I'm trying to think. I don't think much happens after that before we get into our our next, let's say, fight, if you can mm -hmm. call it that. Um, because as the, as they're arguing arguing. Um, uh, a storm rolls in 
a storm that that was not there before. Um, it sort of speeds through the air and, and catches the, the the ships unaware. And in this storm, emerges uh, a bunch of a bunch of let's call them tentacles. I think that's because they call them tentacles. A weird, you know, I know. Smoke. <laughs> right on a limb. Yeah, uh, a long no, sinuous limb and call. As I said, not a limb, a tentacle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they they come <laughs> rocketing out of, out of the air and. Uh, Attacking, attacking the the crew and the ship. Um, well, and the ships, because as we mentioned before, there's there's a couple of them under Brockren's uh, command, and so one reaches down and crushes one of his. What are the medium ships called? Frigates. frigates. Yeah. Crushes one of his frigates, and another one comes down and crushes another frigate. Um, and Don't you? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, for and so after, after these ships go down, we, we find that it's just uh, the Iron Dragon itself is the one ship that's, that is still around, that's still surviving, um, trying to defend itself from these giant uh, tentacles. Uh, they're eventually able to drive it off by shooting a giant harpoon into one of the tentacles, um, which, which injures it enough to sort of stall it for a second. And then they uh, fire off a, a giant, what is it, a proximity mine, some sort of mine? Uh, um, and, yeah. Supremacy is, mine. Supremacy mine, that's what yep. it is. And, uh, ends up blowing it to bits, which is, okay, that, you know, that's pretty cool. I'm into that. Um, and that's how they're able to uh, avoid the same fate that the other other ships um, received. And yet again, after this, we find ourselves back, uh, you know, in, in, in the respite between between fights to the same age-old conversation where the, the uh, Duarden are um, debating strongly whether or not they should go after this age of vein. Um, they're losing ships left and right. Um, they're losing Sorry. crewmen left and right. Um, incurring further debt, you know. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. all the more reasons they need to go and um, check this vein out. And it's at this point that Skaggy really gets real schemy, um, real manipulative, and uh, he lets it spill to the, the, the entire crew of the ship that there's this, there's this take out there that it's just ripe for the taking. Um, yeah. And... Uh, it's it's time that they that they move on it, and so he proposes a uh, a vote uh, for mutiny. Talking about ships, uh, we get we got mutiny on our hands, um, but it's actually real civil. I mean, I, as far as mutiny goes, this is a pretty pretty calm. Um, yeah. They do a re- they do a real cu- quick vote um, amongst well, the, the entire crew whether or not someone wants to throw a bean in or a lentil in, determining whether they want to keep their old captain or not. And. Uh, what do you know? It turns out Brockran gets voted off the island, uh, and he, he's relieved of his command. He's not off the island. They just throw him. He just hangs out downstairs. Actually, they're real cool about it. In fact, and uh, he hands command over to uh, his his uh, Arcanite Arcanite captain. It sounds like our crew is going to go mine this uh, ether ether gold vein out there. Guys, what have we talked about so far that that ca- caught your eye, caught your ear? What were you into? Uh, I really like the idea of the tanker. Right? Yeah. They kind of talked about how the the um, <clears throat> the Iron Dragon was not big enough, and they had special ships that they sent out specifically to be able to harness the Aether Gold and to bring it back, and how it was unsafe to be able to take it in one of these, an ironclad or a frigate, etc., um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> if, if this whole kind of scene, the flesh eaters being in the mountains and uh, having this like actual mining operation reminded me a lot of the um, the uh, diorama in the gay, in the Warhammer World Museum. It's okay. a really cool diorama where they've got like these um, flesh eater courts attacking a mining operation from the Caradron overlords. They have kind of these like set up on different uh, ideas. So between the the flesh eater courts attacking on the ground, and then we've got this kind of like aerial attack with the um, going after the seam, et cetera. Like that very much reminded me of that uh, visual, which is really helpful for me to kind of picture exactly what was going on. Sure. Yeah. Nice. David, what about you? Uh, when they're having a conference with the captains of the frigates, there was like this cool little pseudo gyrocopter like some thing oh yeah that, <laughs> so the captains are that was pretty fun and the ornithopter um, i think they called it yeah, yeah. ornithopter that's right so i thought that was cool and just to reach it back to the game now that allies exist you can fly some gyrocopters around with your overlords and still maintain the overlords uh 
uh, alliance abilities and stuff. So that's that's kind of some cool opportunities there. They're like airborne dinghies, like between the two. Yeah, I'm surprised <laughs> that uh, that uh, Paul didn't mention this, but the uh, it specifically mentions the the uh, uh, quorum summons the uh, summons this tentacle cloud based oh, yeah. thing. Talks about using these ancient elven words, right? And the spell he does is a spell from the old uh, lore of dark magic from the world that was. It's the, you know, <laughs> I didn't get that. No. Yeah, the That's black funny. horror. Um, so it's it's a, yep. it's a call back to that. So um, I was like, oh man, Paul's gonna eat this up, but <laughs> managed to slip past you, I guess. Um, so, but it was like a, a black horror uh, casting on like this huge scale. Um, and I'm curious to see if that uh, ends up making some connections when we see some more from the elves in the realm of shadow um, because it's, it's reaching into this, you know, it's, it's a more, I don't know, Cthulhu for lack of a better thing, like elder God Cthulhu inspired thing that they're reaching back. Um, not specifically chaos gods, but some other like, you know, black horror, a noble thing. So sure. How about that? Um, part of the, uh, I think part of the elf rumors currently do have, kind of a, there may be an eldritch or elder God type of, Right. Um, so, interesting to see if that uh, progresses anywhere or not. Um, yeah, those were those were my takeaways. I think. So, oh, I guess I should also mention uh, the the book does talk about. So it's not um, the battle tone talks about mutinies are not totally like they, it's uh, it's supposed to be a no hard feelings thing. Like it's you know the battle tone talks about that as like if you're not if you're not getting the job done, you know, then someone else is going to take the job, and it's you know no hard feelings and you understand like it just, it'll, it'll happen. Um, and so I think it wasn't totally out of left field that it was a relatively civil affair. Um, yeah. for thing a real, happen. real bloodless coup going on. Right. Uh, Brockman ends, ends up just sort of hanging out downstairs. Like, yeah. while they are yeah. He's a the power. yeah, sure. I mean, you would be, too. Yeah. and but. I'll be honest, I, I was on the side of the, the mutineers for, for a fair amount of this, like for, I was kind of looking at the present, I was like, you're going to go back to your, you know, home fleet. You're going to lose your ship. You're going to lose everyone's super in debt. Like you kind of got to go for your back into a corner. And uh, yeah. I remember feeling like some of his arguments against him was like, I don't, you know. You, yeah. I, I... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, just like you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to suck it up and, and try and turn a profit here. You're about out of options, but yeah. Uh, I, I yeah, didn't I feel had, like he had great grounding for some of his objections uh, at this point, but it did set up a, a conflict and, and uh, let it progress. Yeah, I, I didn't really buy his objections either. I, I was like, why are they just not going after this vein? They're seriously deeply in debt. They either, you know, crash the ship and never go home, or they go to this vein and try and get as much money as they can. I, like, to me, I, I didn't really see any two options from it, but yeah. Well, and you know, we can talk about this later, but like, heck, just just roll up and take a bit. Like, just just take some of it and go claim it later. Like, just yeah. just like yeah, stick your your hand, cup your hand out real fast and, <laughs> and grab some of it. Um, but mm-hmm. at the same time, we as the audience, knowing that the main character is objecting to it, like, we know things are going to go south, uh, as they do. Let me tell you about it. Um, so we've got a new <laughs> new captain of of this here ship. Um, uh, begins with the G, not Grockman. Uh, Gatrum, the Arknight captain. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. So uh, initially, he's initially he's pretty gung ho about his, his new role, but as time goes on, he finds he's less and less interested and less and less suited to, to the job. Um, yeah, he realizes crown. Yeah, exactly. He realizes all the work that uh, Brockman, sort of all the responsibility and stuff that uh, a captain has to deal with. Um, and he's sort of su- he's tested soon enough um, when the the ship, now the lone ship by itself, um, is uh, attacked by a. A flock? What's the word they use for a bunch of chimeras? A menagerie? A I don't know. Sure, a menagerie, a, quite possibly. A ton of them. Yeah, a, yeah, like a, 30 a whole bunch. Plus, 30 plus uh, chimeras. There's a lot. Yeah, sure. It's way more chimeras than you want attacking your ship. Or I, at least I personally want. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they have to deal with uh, <laughs> deal with that. Um, so they're, they're shooting them out of the sky. They're fighting them when they, they board the ship. Um, and uh, you can sort of see um, the, the effort it takes to just even just defend this one strip from this, this group of um, chimeras. Eventually, they drive them off, 
Did they do it in some spectacular fashion, or did they just do it with their martial yeah, prowess? They dropped some of the ether gold uh, onto oh. the nests themselves. So they basically well, that's a little, dropped that's it a in a box later. and dropped it down. Yeah, well, well on the nests is when they fight. Is when they fight like the second group. Because yes, there are two groups of chimeras. I think oh, they, sorry, they, yeah. they might. I think they just problem. managed to fight them off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but I, I guess it just serves to show uh, that the the the, the the challenges aren't done yet to get to this this ether vein, um, and so they they progress forward. Still, they persist and uh, they head um, to to the vein. Um, as they approach it, they find, as Paul sort of alluded to, um, yet another uh, nest of chimeras, sort of up in the air, up in the clouds. I don't think are they just floating? Like they're not they're not on any sort of structure, are they? Like chimeras? Uh, yeah. Uh, I got the not. Yeah. You might. Break, I don't think. I, think. I, I don't think they were on sort of any you know craggy peaks or anything. I think they were just up in the air, like floating on this on this gold. Um, maybe I'm wrong. That'd be dumb. I, I think in my head I thought they were, but I may have just been inserting that. Like I don't know for a fact that. Um, yeah, I, I can't just... remember specifically either, but I agree. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, whether or not they're on rocks or they're just floating on clouds doesn't matter because they, they they blow them the hell up um, by s sending some of the gold at them and uh, and. Uh, destroying the the rest of the pride, I think they call them the pride of Chimera. That sounds right. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. And so those are sort of the last defenders of this of this thing. And so with uh, without any sort of additional adversaries, uh, the overlords get to work on on mining this thing. We fast forward a few days or hours or some stretch of time where they are able to fill the hold of the ship, and uh, Gotram really starts to like realize the the. The danger they're in by having this hold full of this very caustic, explosive, volatile uh, substance, and uh, it, they catch rumor that the, the the rest of the crew is really trying to pack the ship to the gills, trying to fill buckets and pans full of this ether gold because they're so, for lack of a better word, greedy. Um, and so Kashmir has to put the kibosh on that, and he, he uh, develops a, a, a show of the danger they're in by uh, filling a barrel full of this. Um, of this gold and rocketing off the ship and blowing it up and just letting everyone know how much danger they're actually in by having this ship chock full of you know mm -hmm. explosives. They're basically riding a giant bomb. Um, yeah. And so that uh, oh, and, sober and oh, Skaggy is still Skaggy is still the guy really pushing for all this, right? Like he was a guy behind the Skaggy. Me. Now he's the guy being like, we got to fill every pot, we got to fill every pan. So even with Gartram with the new captain, he's really just you know trying to get as much money as possible. He talks about him a lot of constantly working on his little sheet of adding up the sums and, oh, if we fill this pot, we'll have this much more per person. And if we fill this barrel, we'll have this much more per person, right? Yeah. Whenever there's like a, a blatant display of, of greed being uh, shown in, on this crew, Skaggy's often in, in the middle of it. He's, yeah. he's a, yep. a real big instigator. Um, so Everyone kind of comes to the realization that that yeah okay maybe it isn't the best idea but in their best interest to, to fill every pot and pan but is there a way to maybe lessen some of the danger that they're facing by again flying this giant bomb to wherever they want to go and they decide they want to refine some of this ore because of or, uh, this gold because when it's refined it's in a more stable uh, state plus like that's the the mechanism by which it's traded like you don't trade the the gas but you trade like a more, like the ingots of of the mm -hmm. or gold. And they don't want to run the risk of uh, having uh, the people, other folks back at their skyport, like skim off the top. Like they, they want to get as much value out of it as they can. Another example of them trying yeah. to, you know, pinch every penny out of, out of this loot that they found. And so they decide, you know what? No, what we're going to do? We're going to go. Uh, we're going to go um, refine it ourselves. Uh, it just so happens that one of the crew members knows of an abandoned, I don't know, fortress, uh, someplace where they can where they can do just that, where they can break Keep it down into. Oh, yeah, I keep it, um, where they can refine it to a more usable form. And so they go do that. So this was one, of my, this is one of my favorite uh, parts of the book. Um, this setting was actually really cool. So basically the idea is there is this huge peak in the realm of metal, and uh, they had this huge dwarf civilization that were the dispossessed, right? And they started mining out the mountain and eventually they got to the point where 
the mountain itself was so rich with materials that they literally mined out the mountain from underneath the peak. But yet somehow we the, the peak itself still stayed floating. So everyone lived in the peak, but they kept mining and mining and mining. And so the actual yeah. mountain itself was mined out from under the peak and there's a crater in the ground and all their mining machines are down there. But everyone had lived up in the peak itself. Uh, and they built this whole classical dwarven um, just civilization into the peak itself. At least that was my opinion. David, yeah. did you get the same feeling yeah. or... Yeah, I was not 100% clear whether it was dispossessed versus overlords, but uh, regardless, there were Duard in there. Um, mm. And I thought it was very cool. Yeah, Floating Mountain, uh, pretty awesome. Sure. Yeah. Um, we we they, kind of see they... some, some of that in the Rome Gate Wars books, right? Like those sure. islands that were floating. So, yeah, yeah. like, uh, yeah. ground isn't necessarily tethered to the ground yeah. all the time in the, yeah. in the mortal realms. And they, they, this is now abandoned, but it's not clear why, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, our our crew rolls up to this mountaintop, and they, like you said, you, they find it abandoned. And uh, the first thing they do, like rightfully so, is they need to they need to scope it out. They need to um, send a scouting party or, or you know as many folks as they have left to um, both make sure that it's safe and then find the, the the place where they need to. What is it? Do they smelt it? I guess um, to refine the the aether gold. And so a party sets off and sort of navigates through the, the tunnels and halls of this of this mountain peak, and uh, they they immediately realize that something's off, and they get a, a sense that you know there's there's something watching them, and there's some some ill uh, within these these halls of this this keep, and uh, they they see a glowing light off in the distance and some and some houses and so on and so forth, and and boom, what appears but a a nervous force out of nowhere, uh, a bunch of Plague bears, uh, plague bears, and, yeah, and nerdlings, um, etc. Uh, ambush, ambush our 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 Duarden, um, and start you know start start a battle. Uh, it's, it's not an overwhelming cool. force. You know, no, they shouldn't have done that. It's poor form. It's um, naughty. Yeah, it's very naughty. Uh, naughty by nature. Um, and so they they're, they're frightened, <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not a, it's a small force. And the for the most part, the overlords are able to defend themselves and drive off the the Nurgle force. Uh, with one exception, uh, our 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 gunnery sergeant, Drew Mark. Mark. Yep, thund poor guy. thunder, poor guy. He gets he gets a chunk bitten out of his shoulder. Um, as we all know, as avid followers, of, nurgling. Uh, yeah, nurgling. Yep, yep. but one of the least the least dangerous things you could possibly be fighting. Um, come on, man. Uh, Who's my but favorite? What's that? <laughs> favorite so far. <laughs> what? Uh, what was I his can name? See well, it doesn't matter anymore. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, no! no yeah, not he's dead. Not dead. Oh, he just he wounded. Yeah. yeah, he just got bit. But because we're all avid followers of the moral world and fiction, we know if you got you get bit by something nervously, like that's not the end of it. Yeah. And so uh, he he sort of brushes himself off. Probably has a real quick one liner, and then uh, drops out cold. Uh, the, the overlords drag him back to the ship, uh, set him up in a in a infirmary or something that counts as one. And uh, eventually he wakes up, um, realizes he's been injured, freaks himself out uh, because it's not just an injury, uh, but it's actually a, he's got a hitchhiker or a hijacker. What's the word? Uh, well, he's got basically his own version of the um, the, the, the Nurgle guy, the Zeke guy, right? Yeah, the, yeah he's got sure, yeah. on homunculus. Yep, exactly. Um, there's a little face that's just hanging out in his shoulder, whispering weird stuff to him, whispering, whispering sweet nothings to him. Um, and apparently he's the only one who can see it because he, he faces the guy who's supposed to be healing him, and he's pleasantly surprised how quickly his wound is healing. He's healing up just nice. Yeah, good like, job, you, man. You can't see this weird... But, I mean, like it comes off totally like those Nurgle models that have like a Nurgling peeking out from inside the belly or whatever. You're like, yeah. you know, pretty gross. I mean, Real talk, when I read it, I checked both my shoulders just to make sure, <laughs> like you never know. Um, and so he's, he's, he's got this nurgling in his shoulder, whispering stuff to him, telling him what to do. Uh, and slowly but surely, he's sort of overtaking his senses and overtaking his, his, his free will and, uh, and using him as a, as a puppet to do the nurgling's bidding. Um, and so uh, he, that, that Dwarden makes his way off the ship 
back into the, the, the tunnels of this, this keep because while he's been out, um, they found uh, the forge or again, wherever they, they refined this, this ore, or not ore, but ether gold. Um, and, and they're set to work pulling all the gold off the ship and, and, and making it into a more stable form. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's around this time, uh, our old friends show up. Uh, the Zinchian warband, the, the the group of Zinch, uh, who, who's the been rebel. marrying this group this whole time. Yeah, they're the the murder of Zinch, basically. Uh, they they come sneaking their way into the tunnels. I never talked about the little snake eyeball thing from before, but they've had a whole they've had a little yeah. spy on the ship this whole time. Um, that's how they know from the know. tentacle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what happens when but you have to go the through plan. the story. <laughs> turns out this was a plan all along, though. Sure, true. Apparently, um, Corum so, had set this up to be the destination. Yeah, uh, which seems real convenient. Um, so they're flying through the tunnels, and they, they pop out in every every different direction on these Dwarden who are in this giant forge room as they're trying to you know uh, refine this uh, this gold. Um, Zinch attacks, it, ambushes them, and, and strikes from all, all directions. Uh, as we know, the Dwarden are already at sort of uh, thin forces. They've lost a lot of folks so far. Um, and so they're having a hard time defending themselves, you know, without having their big guns on their ships and, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, all hell's breaking loose. Skaggy, Skaggy, Skaggy uh, realizes that uh, he's, chances are slim that he's going to make it out of here alive. So he, he makes a mad dash to try and uh, bargain for his life. So he, he r- rolls up to Coram and says, hey man, uh, I know stuff. I can help you out. Like, if you let me live, it It'll be worth your while. I mean, I'll, I'll make you rich, or I'll give you whatever you want. So, no, no, no. The, the ravings, of, the ravings of a guy who's gonna, you know, die farming for his life. Which is that guy? What, what was his name? Um, <laughs> Scar Scrag. Yeah, that's, 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 that's <laughs> Scrag, the, 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 the butcher. Does he have yeah, a cauldron behind him? Your nickname for him. Uh, uh, Quorum <laughs> senses see something in Skaggy. He sees something he respects or admires. He sees the, the treachery and the, the greediness uh, within this Dwarden soul and uh, says, I'll, I'll do you one better. Uh, you'll, you'll play your part in, in my schemes here. He catches a rune in him or something, marks him as, uh, for his inch, and then sixes his fate master on him, proceeds, proceeds to skewer him right through and, and kills him dead, as you do. Um, and in doing so, that uh, fires off the big reveal, like the big, the big turn at the, at the towards the end of this story. Um, he, he stabs uh, Skaggy, and that uh, sort of is a component of this larger spell that Quorum's trying to implement. As he starts uh, drawing power and, and you know doing Zinchi stuff, and the giant pool of aether gold that's in the middle of this this room uh, starts to coalesce into what I think or I, I picture as a. Um, a lore of change. Um, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, but not just any lore of change, my friends. Uh, a fancy lore of change. It's the, who, who goes by the name of the Prismatic King. Is yeah. that what you were going to say, Paul? Yep. Uh, do you, what, do you, what do you know about the Prismatic King? Uh, he's, in, he, he's involved with the whole uh, first and Prime dealio, right? Well, you well put. Before, we were talking about sure. it. Yeah, do you see why I brought it up, audience? Because he, he, he had Galmaraz. Well, uh, no, it was the Hammers of Sigmar uh, story, right? That's uh, when the Celestine Prime uh, is half of that book is um, Stormcast fighting Corn. The other half is Celestine Prime on a solo mission to uh, find a lost chamber, and it's the Prismatic King that he's up against. So, yeah, exactly. Celestine Prime defeats the Prismatic King in that one um, and uh, banishes him. And so, this is, this is, uh, the prismatic king making his way back into the mortal realms. In this corner, the souls in prime time. In the other corner, prismatic king. Yeah. This is wrestling. Eric, Eric, are you excited to see the return of the prismatic king? Uh, I've been waiting for a long time. For Did you I read tell. Hammers of Sigmar? <laughs> <Is that one? laughs> no, I, you might have. I, I think because I, they, they had like the Bridge of Birds there. I, I don't remember who all read it. That wasn't. Uh, I got the paper view. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Forget I asked. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm making jokes. 
I don't uh, know if you're making them or just attempting them. I read Hammer's Mr. Trying. Mark, and uh, I, I'm sure I've said it before. All, I'm all about when books like overlap yeah. and, and cross reference. Make that reference. Yeah. So, in yeah. fact, I was having I was having a, a, a bummer time this whole time until we found the Prismatic King, and now I love the book. Two thumbs up. All you gotta do is link it up. <laughs> uh, so, the Prismatic King, uh, draped in gold, basically made of gold, is, is sort of reaching and clawing his way out of this giant pool. I feel like that's so, a, that's a trope you see. Somebody hit their Lord of Change with some Retributor Gold primer and uh, yep. gave it a dip, well, called it good. Well, but like a real thick Fair layer too. Yeah. Yeah. He's dripping. Like he, it's it's yeah. he's still not quite solid. Sure. Um, and so he starts wreaking havoc too. If he thought things were bad before, and now we've got a, a, a named Lord of Change uh, wrecking face as well. He's casting spells. He's he kills a thunderer. I mean, he's just going to town. He's, he's drawn dwarves as dwarven uh, essences out of them and empowering uh, Quorum. Uh, things are going wild. Um, it's around this time. That uh, oh my God, Drew Mark, Drew Mark, um, uh, he he made his way <laughs> into the tunnels as well, uh, uh, sort of egg, being egged on by the Nurgling in his in his psyche, who's now basically taking control of him. And he's and the Nurgling tells him, "Hey man, we got we got this Laura change. We got the Prismatic King, who's who's making his way into the mortal realms. Um, you aren't going to be able to stop him without my help." And so uh, he navigates his, his way into the tunnels and fights off that snake that we were sort of talking about before. Um, and uh, eventually the Nurgle part of him takes, takes control and, and they go uh, and uh, basically face, face the Lord of Change. On their way, they come across uh, Brokren, who was also in the tunnels for some reason. So uh, I wasn't yeah, there. I think Brokren was I think in he the... Went, he went in to find... Go ahead. He went in to find Grockman, or not Grockman, uh, Gord Drewmark. Drewmark. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they link up. Drewmark is uh, the answer to every question. Uh, Brockman realizes soon that like his, his friend isn't his friend anymore, but uh, since they have a, a common enemy, they join forces to, to try and uh, take the Lura change out, or at least enact this plan that the Nurgling has. Um, so they roll up. Uh, Brockman tries to distract uh, the Lura change. Um, he ends up having to duel the Fate Master at the same time. It's, it's wild. It's crazy. Things get out of hand real quick. Uh, but what is important is Drew Mark with his Nurgling friend uh, face, you know, stand on the, the Lord of Change and start repeatedly repeating his true name. And if you guys know anything about demons, knowing their true name is a hardcore power move. Um, and, and Bad starts, juju, yep. Yeah, yeah, nobody wants it. Um, it's coming in a few times. Sure, yeah, constantly. <laughs> uh, it First. sort of... It gets him to st stop the, the Lord of Change dead in his tracks. The Prismatic King dead in his tracks. And if it's said enough times, they end up um, locking him up and, and he can't can't affect the battle anymore. Does that end up killing him too? Did I make that up? I, think, I, think it just I don't think they killed him, but I think they dispersed his essence, basically. So that's sure, part of quite what... possibly. I mean, I think he managed yeah. to them back, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, and there's the is the is the well? Um, let's that basically they they render him uh, oh, inert because sure. um, I think he still hangs out for a little bit because while yeah. this is all going on, um, the the rest of the Duarden who are still fighting for their lives, uh, defending themselves against each, um, they get a new burst of energy, seeing their captain rolling up and you know uh, rallying them to their cause, uh, and they they mount a, a one la last defense all the while, uh, Rock Rockman. Uh, the ether chemist, who all the, this whole time has been sort of um, instrumental in getting these folks this far, um, makes a mad dash for the controls of the smelting room, starts pulling levers like crazy, which is what I would do, um, and uh, <laughs> is, is going to be letting loose uh, all these caustic materials and, and uh, gases and, and, and incendiary stuff um, into the room, uh, which is his last ditch effort to sort of set set things right and, and save this crew that he's, he's joined. Uh, so uh, we've got stuff about to be pouring into this room. We've got a, a nerd prismatic king. We've got um, Zinch folks flying all around. Things are going to hell. Uh, the Jordan decide it's time to get the heck, heck up out of here. So they, uh, they boogie out. Um, basically, most of our, our, our named characters are able to try and escape and navigate through the, the, the tunnels. Uh, Grockman's not so lucky. Uh, he gets sort of uh, melted by his own 
machinations by pulling the, all the, the stuff into the room. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a little... <laughs> <laughs> a little, little bit of a, a knowable sacrifice sort of thing. Like I think he yep. knows he's going down. So sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and then Matt Brockren, Brockren ends up uh, going up through the chimney. Yeah. As, so, I mean, yeah. where, cool where would you go? Yeah. Sure. yeah. But so, then the, the the fate master chases him up the chimney. Yeah. So while he sees all his friends go one way, he decides to go up a chimney instead. Um, and so he starts climbing a chimney, and the fate master is chasing him and. It's this whole, like, slow, like, it's on the edge of your seat chase, but it's, like, just people inching up a, a chimney. It's a weird yeah. juxtaposition of what you're seeing. Um, yeah. Fate Master's, <laughs> like, jabbing him. Like, as he... <laughs> it's appropriate that you have your knife. Nice. Um, yeah. And I guess this is a weird thing to talk about. Like, it's, let's slow down for a second. Let's talk about this this chimney thing. I, it was It took me out of what was going on. Like, we were just had this mad dash of everybody running and escaping out of the tunnels and a bunch of crap falling into this room and the Lord changed it's melted blah 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 and like the culmination is of a dwarf climbing this chimney like getting poked and prodded by it like a fate match the most uh, I don't know anticlimactic sort of way that this could possibly end he's, yeah. he's climbing towards daylight yeah. it's also a little odd that like these incredibly toxic fumes are not you know when they're channeled into this chimney are not sufficient to like <laughs> like if, if he was down in there he's in trouble you know it's like the purpose of the chimney is to vent these awful things up and so theoretically he's right in the path of all this venting thing so i i thought it was i thought it was maybe an idea for a scene but it, it didn't uh didn't land well, as well sure. as yeah and issues. i think narratively what the point was was to separate drumark or not drumark uh brockren from the rest of the crew so they could have this moment of like oh my goodness we failed everything and we've lost Brockran and then could have this wonderful reunion later you know right I think, what they talk about at the end of the book it it almost seems like he did it on purpose like yeah um it was still i, I think i said it before but it was a little it was a little silly but so be it sometimes sometimes books are silly um but as you can expect uh he's able to turn the situation, Brockman's able to turn the situation around on the Fate Master. He's basically got him in his grip. He's got him right where he wants him. Uh, by just, I guess, Dwarden cannonballing him a little bit. Sort of tucks and rolls and just <laughs> pops him in the face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose you don't have a lot of options available to you. Like, he shoots him and he can't. It's useless. And so he throws a gun at him and that's nothing. Like the classic, yeah. you know, shoot and then huck a gun. Uh, and then he just cannonballs right on his stupid Fate Master face. Uh, and Throws him, throws him down into the abyss with all the caustic materials and never to be seen again. Yeah. Um, and so he's able to <laughs> climb out uh, towards the, out the top of the chimney and he just sort of chills on top of the, the mountaintop uh, waiting for somebody to rescue him. Once yeah. uh, everybody else makes it out to the ship, they're all, you know, they dust themselves off. They're having a great, uh, great time. Um, they're, they have every intention of just boogieing the heck up out of there and leaving anyone who's left behind um, to their own devices. But the last minute, they decide to circle back around just to check to see if there's any survivors. Um, they find Brockran chilling on the mountaintop. They pick him up, and that's guys. That's basically the end of the story, right? That's that. That's the end. They fly off under the sunset. Not no. quite. No. 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 Um, well, let me okay. ask you a question. Hit me. When when deciding to go back and see if anybody's still alive, they have a meeting, debate about it three times. First. You know, you bring up a good point. No, they didn't do that. It's, I think it says somewhere in the book that all of the Dwarden have the same thought at the same time. Like, should we just go? Like, should, should we should we just get out of here? And it's, I guess, like clockwork, they decide, eh, maybe not. We should go find the captain. Um, that was a weird point for me, too, where it was like how the crew could be so heartless to think that we should just leave the captain here because we won't be responsible for this mutiny. Like, nobody's ever going to know. Yeah. Um, but it's a change of a heart, a change of heart from... Uh, Gotram, who, who decides now nah, I'm captain now. I'm gonna go. I'm still gonna go find a uh, broker. He's weird. I don't know. Uh, so they're they're trying to make their escape. They're almost they're almost you know gone. But uh, Coram has one more trick up his sleeve. So he's able to survive the whole conflagration inside the, the mountaintop. And uh, his last ace in the hole is uh, boom dragon. Basically, just like that. I just described how he summons them. I think boom dragon is, is how it, <laughs> how it's summed up. Uh, yeah, dragon... I think it might have been like cloaked and following the the boat for some time. Like it was there. I don't, know. I don't even know if it was cloaked. I think it was just not it, not in existence, and then was in existence. Yeah, it was like 
it phases it in and out of like oh, the planar yeah, system or something right. like that. Sure. Um, okay. Which I don't know that could do, but if somebody could do it, I reckon it'd be a zinch dude, right? Yeah, sure. Um, and so from one second there's no dragon, and then the next second there's a dragon, uh, and it and it's barreling down on this on this on this ship, and so they they. The Dwarden know they're not going to outrun it. They're not going to outgun it. Um, how, how are they going to get out of this this sticky situation? Um, and so what it boils down to is Broken says, all right, I know what to do. I'm not captain, but like I'll, I'll show you what's what. And he, he concocts this like instantaneous plan that he just knows. I think he just has it saved in his head. Um, <laughs> they launch a superiority mine, and it blows up, but it stuns it. It doesn't kill it. It falls underneath the ship. Uh, which is exactly what Brockman wants, wants him, as it drops the entire hold of what's left of the Aether Gold on top of it, and uh, it melts the wings of the dragon, which plummets to its death. Uh, no more dragon. Yep. Peace out, dragon. Um, yep. And is Corm writing it, writing it down? Does he? Yep. Yeah, yeah, he does. Which I mean, that's pretty metal, right? In the realm, of, in the realm of metal. Yeah. <laughs> Going down with the ship, so, so to speak. And oh, so, uh, uh, okay. Oh, I was gonna say how I how I learned to stop worrying about the bomb or whatever, Doctor. <laughs> Doctor Strange. <Love. laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that make a sweet album cover, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's it, guys. There's no, finally, finally, there's nothing attacking the Dwarden anymore. I think they're they're in the clear. I'm not even yeah. kidding. That's that's for serious. <laughs> um, Besides crippling, terrible debt. Sure, just a whole bunch of that. <laughs> as we find, find out, the last monster to face. As we find out at the end of the story, Brockman doesn't even care anymore. Like at this point, no. uh, he's, got, he's got a good story, and that's worth that's worth way more than gold. Um, apparently, uh, apparently his, his debtors are gonna like just love love to hear his, his sweet story <laughs> that he's gonna tell. Um, yeah. Because that's that's the gist. That's where we basically leave our, our crew. Is that uh, Brockman gets his ship back? Everybody. Uh, Sort of acquiesces and says, "No, man, it's it's yours." After this, after, after that display of dragon fighting, um, we're we're your crew again, and uh, let's get the heck up out of here. And they do, uh, and that is the end of the story. Hey, Eric, what do you think? Good, good story. You know, um, from my point of view, I mean, it didn't it wasn't the the ratio of uh, story and time is almost perfect. Sure, sure. No. You're welcome. I, I I definitely um I, I like the general gist of the story. I like that angle of hey, we're going. I mean, it's a core story of Caradron. We hear about a vein of Aether Gold. Uh, we got to go out and get it. And the skies are full of dangers. Like it's not just a fishing trip, right? They they've got to go in and deal with it. It seems like on this extreme end of like taking a toll and coming out, you know, owing more and, and losing more than, than, than bringing back nothing. Um, doesn't necessarily paint these guys in a great light. Like, it, it's interesting. It's not a, a, a her, it, there's some heroic journey, but there's not a, a profitable journey here, right? It's not, not showing their best business side, I guess. Um, yeah. But, but it definitely, it seems like it, it does the job of humanizing or, or doing some of that balance between their business and their heart, you know? Um, so, I, I mean, from that standpoint, I mean, I, I like the context of it. What did you guys think about the story? Oh, no, that's actually all the time we have for today. So, all right, bye, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night. Boom. No. No, I... Yeah, I agree with what, what, what you're saying. Um, and beyond that, just to confuse a little bit, um, I think there was a lot of good ideas, like a lot of like story elements or like scenes that I enjoyed. Uh, it was just more how we got there, like the interconnecting parts that um, took me out of it sometimes. But uh, like any any number of those fights, I would have liked to have played out. Like I would have I played those with, you know, models. Um, yeah. Which I think is what sometimes AOS fiction is trying to get you to do, right? Like, it, it wants to paint those scenes that people want to play. Um, and maybe sometimes the, the space in between those scenes is just window dressing. Maybe. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, um, C.L. Werner in um, the Ever, was it Everqueen? Yeah, the, the, the Everqueen. Uh, mm -hmm. was, was a lot of combat. It was a lot of battle and a lot yeah. of... 
That's a good that point. was one of the critiques then was just that it was it was like when we did the review, we skipped over a couple of chapters because it didn't feel like it revealed anything. It was just more opportunity to show them in different combat. Yeah. Um, but that critique seems to hold true here that that's a, a style of this. Um, um, if you guys want to say something? All right, I'm going to start rattling off questions. Uh, well, I, I didn't understand. There's a lot of things I didn't understand, but I'll start off with, why didn't they just go back and get the Ether Gold now that the Prismatic King was gone? I don't think it is Ether Gold anymore. Like, is it? Was it still Yeah, Aether I think Gold? they figured out it was tainted. Like, the reason it was so powerful was it was tainted by the... Like, it, it may oh. not have been. It was, like, faux. Well, but it, once they refined it, it could burn it anyway, right? Or even unrefined, they could still burn it. But I mean, that's what, when the they quorum, quorum was there to make sure the prismatic king was actually raised. Mm -hmm. So when, if quorum was... isn't there, then the prismatic king wouldn't be raised. Well, it'd the be active... tainted, but is the act of refining it was uh, what brought him into existence. So I mean, I think also it was a huge cataclysmic process. So I, I mean, I think it's fair to assume that. Uh, when the mountain burned up inside, that the aether gold was lost, or could have been. Well, yeah, but I meant like the other stuff, like the the stuff that was still left in the cloud, because they only got as much as could fill the frigate or the, mm. the ironclad, and there was just a ton left. Like, yeah. I totally understand the whole prismatic king tainted, etc. But if you've already banished the prismatic blah, blah, king, blah. It's, I mean, like, I, I literally, I was like, I read the end of the book, and I was like, oh, they could just go get that ether gold and become rich. Oh, no, go, so go, back, go back and to that poison well. Up. Maybe it's not poison anymore. Maybe, maybe <laughs> exactly. this time it'll work. Well, know? I was agreeing with you, Paul. Like, what, what's a little, like, prismatic king in your gold? Like, right? No. What, what is it? I mean, for how much money it is? I don't know. For how much money it is, I'll be like, hey, I'll deal with a little prismatic king. We'll just burn them up in little pieces, right? Only refine a certain amount at a time. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. That was my first that, question. Fair enough. That could have fallen under, like, I mean, part of the moral of the story seems too is like, um, you know, what it, what you risk, right? Even when they had a full crew, the idea of risking for this was a maybe a bad idea. Like, could have been seen as a bad idea by some. And so, when you have even less, and you just survived it by the skin of your teeth, we talked about luck. Like, is, would that have been just pressing their luck at that point? Uh, I think definitely. Um, David, any thoughts before I get into specific? Um, no, I'll have some then. follow ups. Let's hit the questions first, and then uh, right. I got one or two comments. But. Guys, who is your MVP? I, I've so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was my favorite character seven times. Um, my MVP actually is not a character in the book because I, I, I had a hard time uh, making it through. Uh, but there are two paragraphs in there. He talks about grot bag scuttlers, and those two paragraphs fit exactly what I wanted to do with the models. So, like, my MVP is actually just this little aside that he did, but it's like, no, that's perfect. I love that. That's exactly what I want. So, so all in all, MVP. all in all, good book, uh, Davey, MVP. Um, for a while it was actually Skaggy, uh, but he ended up like not having you know because it's on i was like yeah man like these guys should be working for, towards a profit and he seemed you know to be driving it but uh he ended up pretty like irredeemably greedy like he didn't he was a pretty one-tone dude so uh backed off of that um i don't know it's a tough one uh nobody apparently it's yeah, no one. yeah. <laughs> uh i enjoyed the as, as far as the character read i think i enjoyed the fate master Okay, sure. He was a little uh, uh, off the beaten path, a little out of the yeah. ocean. Um, I think my dude was Jumark the, the Thunderer, or Gunnery Sergeant, whatever he was. Um, yeah. uh, he was cool, yeah. He, he was cool. I mean, he was drunk all the time, which doesn't, that's not why I like him, but uh, the fact that like, there ended up being something, maybe token, but something underneath all that. Uh, plus, uh, he had a pretty sweet deck, deck sweeper, which is, I think, yeah. is legit. Yeah. <laughs> Mowing people down. I'm into that. Um, so he's plus obviously his importance in like saving the, what was left of the crew at the end of the book by standing up to uh, the prismatic king with you know Nurgle on his back. Um, that was pretty legit. Uh, I'm sure he burned up, but it would be cool if he didn't. Like he's half maybe demon at this point, so maybe somehow he he survives. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I think as we know, there's a sequel on its way. So maybe that's not the last we saw of Drew Mark. Yeah. My dude. Uh, and I think we all found out who Eric's favorite character was. Uh, we won't get into yeah, Several times. I actually, yeah, I answered that question a few times. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> do we think we learned, and I think we might have alluded to this question a little earlier, but do we think we learned anything about the moral realms that we didn't know before? Um, uh, there was a cool, uh, when he talked about the mountain, he talked about it, there was a peak floating. Beneath it was actually a jungle. So it was an interesting thought for me to dwell on, is having a jungle in the realm of metal, and what exactly would that look like? Some would argue um, jungles are super metal. Yeah. Uh, and then also the whole, like, actually having full-on man- mining equipment. He kind of described it, like, as if almost there were, like, tractors or, you know, like, mining machines. So that's all stuff that we had not seen or heard of before. So was, that seemed like a cool aspect, and when the mountain came down, it crashed upon the, the whole mining works, etc. So that was that was a cool, um, and, and, and like actual industry, right? We haven't actually had scenes of actual industry because it's either been out in the country or in the city, and this was a specifically a scene of actual industry. So that was kind of cool. Where's the farmers? They were in the jungle, but you couldn't see them because the, the leaves are too big. You're gonna die on that hill, aren't you? Um, <laughs> I think it's no. It's just poking fun. <laughs> no, I don't. Obviously, uh, David, what'd you learn? Uh, I think I think it was a big thing early on. It was just uh, somehow they they traded with uh, the locals. Um, one thing I wanted to learn, but didn't. You guys know what uh, um, Sky Fleet? These guys were from what hold? Uh, nope. Where are the characters? Know? And even if I read it, I wouldn't remember it. Yeah, I don't. Barrick Zilfin. So they're supposed to be... But this is my point. is like there was nothing to distinguish them from any other. Like these these are all very characterful sky holds, right? Barrick uh, Nar versus Barrick Urbez versus Zilfin versus Mornar. Uh, but they they read as indistinguishable from each other. The Urbez dude versus the Zilfin guys. I mean, these guys are supposed to be consummate sailors. So I uh, I thought it was a little... I was hoping to have learned some more about one skyhold versus another, and they, they didn't seem all that different from themselves or versus the, uh, who we'd seen before in um, Spirit of Shadows. Uh, those those overlords were uh, from Mornar, and oh. they, they felt a little plug-and-play from each other. Gotcha. So. Wait, wait, uh, wait to bring me down. Um, so, for the thing <laughs> that, uh, as far as I'm learning, I, I've never even cracked the, the KO battle tome until after I'd read this book. Um, so, I knew very little about how they operated or what they did. I guess a little bit of spear shadow was just those characters. So I, I learned about the things that I then proceeded to re- reinforce when I read the battle tome. Um, yeah. uh, I think it, given that I read them in that order, I think it did sort of highlight some stuff about the KO that I, I didn't know. Like it, it, it could be a, a good um, first step into their lore or what, what, how they tick or how they operate. Um, and then it's just expanded on in, in the battle tome later on. Uh, Paul, you had a question about like um, the the writing process and whether or not how like mm-hmm. the battle tome informs the writing. What what did, what did you want to talk about there? Uh, well, I was reading uh, Ask FM again. Josh Reynolds was talking uh, about a question that he was asked of whether or not the writer gets the battle tome or the codex before they're writing, and the answer was no. Uh, they typically don't, and um, also if they request it, then they can of course get access to it. But in general, that's not standard procedure. Um, and to me, that, at, from my completely subjective opinion, uh, very much feels like uh, C.O. Warner did not get a chance or take the opportunity to look at the battle tone. Um, I had mentioned before that one of my things I was really looking forward to was having a specific KO fighting style, right? Um, and I, that, for me, completely dropped the ball. Uh, basically, it was just a bunch of guys on ships firing off guns. Uh, I think you just nailed their fighting style. <laughs> well, but the thing is, they have all these harpoons, right? And they have the the sky cutter, or the not the sky cutters, the endron riggers, and they've got like all these different weapons that really allow them to go flying around the the setting, right? So I was really waiting for one of them to shoot a harpoon into one of the siege guys and go flying over there and just start whacking them in the head or something like that, right? Or even the ships themselves. Like, there really wasn't a set of armament, 
that really seem to fight uh, set out into a actual fighting style in the air. Cool. Um, like the supremacy mine or anything like that. Yeah, the supremacy mine was kind of cool, but that was. I I really wanted more. Let's just put it that way, right? Um, well, well, CL Warner, if you're listening to this, and I know you are, uh, book two, give, give, give us some more, give us some more of that. Yeah. Um, the it second thing I was really, really the second thing I was really really hoping for was that I was really hoping for a writing set in one of the skyports. The skyport seemed like a really fascinating place to me. Um, and I was really hoping that that would be some place that we explored, uh, yeah. but that didn't really seem to happen. Um, so I, I think my expectations were in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, but then as far well, as I the think, book itself, go ahead. Well, I just I think you've highlighted some good things that very well could make their way into a sequel to this book. I feel like going to a skyport is kind of like a natural progression of yeah uh, of this book. Uh, and then the last. Uh, part that I had a that made it really hard for me to read is that Corum just felt very much like a MacGuffin. Um Davey you pointed out that um the the dark horror spell was from the dark dark magic range and then he was using Zinch magic and then he had this box with this dragon but then he also had the he could manipulate the Nurgle because he made the Nurgle show up in the sky hold itself and so he just he seemed to have so much power. And when they fought against the guys on the discs, they were just completely destroyed. But when they fought against the Manicor, it was just one ship. They just obliterated the Manicors. And so for me, there was there was not a good shift of balance to the different battles to make them feel believable. So I, I, I had a hard time making it through those. The, the one thing I liked about the overwhelming power of Zinch was that it really highlighted the fact that Korm really thought he was just playing with these folks. Like, at any yeah. point, he could have destroyed them. He didn't feel like it. And that was kind of a that was driving the plot forward in a way. It's like they needed to be overpowered to sort of give the sense that um, they could destroy them whenever they wanted to, but they, they didn't because the, there was a plan in place that needed to keep them, keep them alive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I can see why that would maybe rub you the wrong way. And I think if anyone's got a ton of assets, it's going to be like a follower of Zinchi's, like, you know, try to prep the battlefield as, as best they can. Like he's been plotting and scheming to try and, you know, have as many, you know, uh, pieces on the board as they can before, saying like mm -hmm. it's go time so um well i understand the objection i think if it was going to work for anyone it was going to work for a, a z oh for sure yeah, yeah. Pick right. The right god to use i'm not going to ask my last question yet you guys any any polls any questions you want to ask of the I was group? Add to that, it sounded like i mean uh from right. listening to it that um that uh what's his name the the changeling guy um you know, quorum. Was, quorum. Um, you know, he set the scene. He knew where he was going to ambush. He kind of was pushing them in a particular direction and having having things ready and unbalanced to his favor. Um, in terms of Thank you. Um, Hit me. Piggybacking on uh, uh, Paul's comment of uh, of uh, wanting to see a fighting style. My specific thing to that effect would be I, I would have loved to see some more from Sky Wardens and Engine Riggers, like the, yeah. the you know, quote-unquote bubble guys. Um, they had a couple cool things where they would, like, be lashing themselves to boats so they didn't get blown away by wind or using chain. But it, it was just probably, I mean, maybe a sum total of six or seven sentences in the, in the whole book, um, which, again, back to Paul's point, you know, maybe he just didn't, if he hadn't read the Battle Tome, hadn't had a copy, maybe just didn't really have a good concept of what they were, what they did, or anything like that. I, um, I thought that was a, a little bit missed. Um, I remember early on being excited in some of the first, and maybe in that very first one, the Urbaz fleet is getting knocked out. Um, but some of the like uh, aerial, you know, ship to ship combat, and you've got Arcanauts are firing from the deck of a, of a sky vessel. Um, I was like, oh yeah, this is super cool. I want to do this on board. And you're like, I guess you'd have to come up with something a little bit custom, which you can totally do. Um, but as they as they play on the table, you got a bunch of guys running around uh, a lot of times. So, uh, but it did make me try to think of like what kind of a custom game can you come up with where it's actually all in the sky, you know, only flying things, and you know how can you actually let uh, embark guys shoot, even though those rules don't necessarily exist, but do do some of that stuff would be would be pretty fun. So try and come up some. 
the 40k open top wheels thing. So yeah, something like that. Top vehicles. Um, you know, but I mean, there's there's naval rule sets. You could you could probably find a way to um, customize some of that or take some pieces from that or something like that. So boarding actions, yeah. that sort of thing. Pretty cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, write that up and uh, talk about it next next week. Uh, I guess. All right. I'm on it. Homework. <laughs> Uh, any other any other questions, thoughts before I lead into my last or one of my last ones? No, go Paul, for I, Paul, I know you do. No. All right, fine. Here we go. Uh, I always <laughs> like to talk about what what shape are the characters in, or at the end of this this story, where, where the setting. It's not really a question; it's just a recap of where everybody's at at the end. Um, basically, we found that the, those all the expendable Zinchian characters were eliminated. As far <laughs> as we know, they're they're all gone. Um, the Prismatic King was halted, uh, but being a demon, um, there's always going to be that threat of him, him returning. Back. He'll be yeah. back, and, and I hope he is, because yeah. uh, I love him books and links across the different novels. And uh, much of the crew of the Iron Dragon lived to fight another day. Broker uh, has cemented his place as the captain of the ship. Yeah. Uh, he's still broke, but he has enough accomplishments under his belt that he's going to stave off any rumors of that curse that he's got left, and make hopefully it'll be a way to keep his ship. And... Uh, he has his sights on this monster that we have not talked about this entire time, but um, basically his white whale. Uh, yeah, the source of the curse. Yeah, Gazool that he needs to take on. So I reckon that's probably going to be the subject of later books. I bring this up because I like to look forward. What, what what can we expect in the future? I think that's my new favorite thing in the whole book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the idea that he has a white whale. It's a. I mean, it, obviously, it's a it's a bit of a trope, but I don't know. This is the guy who has it in AOS, so it seems I, I really enjoy reading that book. Yeah, no. Uh, and that's the end of it. Do we want to give final final opinions, final thoughts, maybe final ratings? We don't really do that all that well, but uh, I mean, I, again, I, I've said it a number of times. I, a lot of times, I, I feel like the the fiction works best when it's in shorter form, uh, and so uh, some of the character motivations or development um, don't always hold up in these in these longer books. If you're looking at it from like a you know, reading, you know, like real high quality stuff or whatever. Uh, that said, there was some, there was some fun stuff. I, I was real excited at the beginning. I, I kind of went through the, the first bits pretty quick because that when you were learning, when you were getting new bits and pieces mm -hmm. from the, uh, it, it was, it was pretty exciting for that. So um, I, uh, it was not my favorite, but I would not, um, I would not count out the sequel. I would certainly check out the sequel in hopes that like maybe it, it uh, picks up some of the spots that um, didn't quite pull the trigger for me on this one. Cool. Paul, oh, tell me about it. Um, I'd probably read the sequel just because I, I, I would hope that it would be a little bit more fleshed out uh, as far as KO are concerned. Um, but um, I, I didn't particularly enjoy this book, so I had, I had a hard time finishing it. So, um, sure. yeah. Gotcha. Um, and from my end, I think I mentioned it before. A lot of the what in the book I thought was real cool. Like the, the like on paper, this book not the book, um, but on paper it, it it looked real well. The plot outline seemed seemed good to me. It was just the the how, like the like how we got from point A to point B to point B to C. Yeah. Uh, uh, missing some stuff for me, but uh, maybe we can get more of that in the next one. Um, I I think I echo you guys. I'll, I'll probably read the sequel. I don't regret regret reading this one. Um, yeah. And there it is. Uh, Eric, you want to do your thing? I do want to do my thing, and I, I first of all just want to say thank you guys for letting me hang out, even though I hadn't uh, been able to close this out. Yeah, at least tell us what you were painting this whole time. I'm painting uh, skeletons. Okay. Uh, I just finished up a unit of eleven. Oh, delightful! <laughs> um, delightful. It is time for our reforging. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Comment below. Leave a review for us on iTunes or follow us on Podbean. You can also follow us on Twitter. Davey, where can they find you on Twitter? At red underscore Z. Aaron, where can they find you on Twitter? Give me an A or an A-D-O-A-T. Paul, where can they find you on Twitter? At PJ Shard. And uh, you can find me, Eric, at Stone Monk Gamer. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to uh, meeting you here again next month uh, for some more stories and uh, reviews uh, in the Age of Sigma.